Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. We'll get started this morning as, uh, as our call to worship. I didn't get a hold of Ryan. I should have through the week picked out songs, maybe. And uh, I have the funny feeling that a couple of my songs, me and him usually do pretty good together. <laughs> we usually hit one or two that is right along with his, his sermon. So um, <clears throat> I'm praying that I, I did that this week. But uh, a lot of my songs have to do with Jesus. So I can't miss there. <laughs> <laughs> So anything to do with uh, those three big <laughs> things, then, then I think I'll hit pretty good. Uh, I'm going to read out of Colossians, the second chapter, uh, verses 2 and 3. <clears throat> and Paul to, the, to Colossae says, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. When you think about what Paul is saying here, is the most important thing that we need to get is have Christ in our lives. We can have almost anything else. If we don't have Jesus, we don't have a chance. We just don't. Here he is saying that. You have, I want you to have complete understanding. I want you to be in line with God. And the way to do that is through His Son, Jesus. And I think that should be all of our goals. Just like Paul says to them, my goal to you is to you to understand this. As long as you have Jesus, you, you've got that rock to hold on to. And I know Sarah said that this morning in our class, talking about we struggle with some things, and as long as we have God and Jesus in our lives, we always can grab hold of that. We can always grab hold and say, I need some help here. Please help me out. I'm struggling with this. I need some help. God in Christ is always there for us. Always. He's always there for us. So, first song we're going to sing is Blessed Assurance. Because we have that assurance in our life as long as we have Jesus. <clears throat> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my soul. Song, pray. 
to this, Jerry leaves an opening prayer. <clears throat> Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come follow me, and we see where thy footprints falling, lead us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow, we will
prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we're going to sing, Praise Him, Praise Him. And a lot of times we don't sing this song uh, before the Lord's Supper, but if you listen to the words that uh, it's in the song, we should be thinking about this. Praising Him all the day long for what He did for us. Sacrificing Himself on the cross for us. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing over His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. you to stay in there and I want you to also then roast that lamb 
not boil it, but roast it and eat it all, and, or if you were unable to eat it all, then burn the remainder, but do not save it till the next day. And then the Lord passed over the land, and this is where we get the words, the Passover. The Passover of the Lord and His death angel on the land. So, the, his people were protected through that action of a sacrifice of a lamb and the blood on the doorstep. This became an annual feast, the Passover. Now, we don't celebrate the Passover, uh, the Passover, but they had celebrated this for 1,200 years by the time Christ came. I can't even imagine 1,200 years passing by and then... Um, Jesus was in Jerusalem. This is his final days on earth. Uh, the disciples said, what would you like to do? Uh, we need to prepare the Passover. And he said, go into the village. You'll find a man with a pot of water, this and that. And he will show you. Went to this upper room. And they made the plans. And so Jesus uh, went up there. And the time of year that this occurred would have been about our... Gregorian calendar, March or April area. Okay, this predates uh, Easter, by the way, which came later as uh, something created really by man. Okay, so the Passover really coincides with that springtime. But Jesus went into there, and he, uh, they were having their meal. And all the synoptic gospels tell of this. Uh, event. So he told them, you know, one of you are going to be training. Uh, you know, and he was explaining that I'm going to be given up and all of that. And they probably didn't understand what was going on. And they likely really didn't get it when he picked up the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. And then he took the cup and he said, uh, drink all of this, and then this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Okay. So Jesus was explaining to them that he would be the lamb sacrificed. And that it was his sacrifice, like the lamb was sacrificed for Passover, innocent as could be, but he would then protect them and death would then be able to pass over those that followed Christ. Death in the sense of spiritual death. Okay? So there's a tremendous correlation there. And what we call the Last Supper truly was the last Passover supper for God's purposes. It doesn't mean that it's still not celebrated but it carries, there's the significance passed on that one night. So we see the beginning of it with Moses. We see the end of it with Christ. So as Christ did that, he instituted what we refer to as the communion, or um, the breaking of bread, or um, we refer to it as several things. And it all means the same thing. Now, is it the Passover? No, it's not the Passover. But we should be able to visualize where it came from, the roots of it, and how Jesus then transformed it into his sacrifice and his body. And so what is the purpose that we do this? And why don't we do it just once a year? Well, we don't do it just once a year because we see in the Bible examples that they did it on the first day of the week. And so that's why we do it. And I think that's the proper way of looking at it. The purpose is to remember. Okay, what are we remembering? We're remembering the life, the death, and the resurrection of our Savior. We remember that. And we remember it in two ways. We remember it with tangible elements. Okay? These are tangible things. These are bread wine, fruit of the vine, whatever you want to call it, those sustain us physically. That's like food for our physical body. 
But even though we ingest that physically, it also helps us to remember that Christ in us is what sustains us spiritually. Okay, we have to, we have, to have that connection. Uh, it's a confession of, our, of a personal Savior to us. It's not, uh, this needs to be personal to you when you take this. It's not just the group, the whole, it's for you. It is that you are remembering Jesus and that he gave everything to you and to me personally. And it's not abstract in some way. It's very personal to each of us. It's also a proclaiming of the Lord's sacrifice until He returns. We proclaim His sacrifice each time we do this. Um, and it is sacred. It should never be treated as common or flippant or vain. It should be sacred to us. And it also should cause us self-examination. In the, in the sense that we're not perfect, but we need to be continually testing our motives and attitudes in our Christian walk. So as we take this morning, and as we do every, every first day of the week, let us truly consider the impact of this that really had its beginnings over 3,000 years ago, and yet we continue it now as Christ said, the new covenant. He said, drink this in the new covenant, the new agreement, the new contract that I establish. So if you would pray with me. Father, we, we thank you for the life that we have. You have provided us uh, the physical life. You've provided us a spiritual salvation. We do remember Jesus, even though we've never met him, even though we've never been there when he was sacrificed, we want to remember all that he is, all that he has done, and that he is alive, living, and leading. We pray, Father, that as we partake of these emblems, that we remember the spiritualness that is within us, and that is Jesus in you, and that Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, that as we do it, we do it humbly, and that we would consider uh, the course in our life, the path that we're choosing, the things that we think of, and that we would choose to serve you above all else. In his name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we gather around your table once again, giving you all the praise and all the glory for the great gift and sacrifice that was made for us. Thank you, Jesus, for going to that cross. We have to be talked about this morning. We've been totally lost, each and every one of us, 
if this great sacrifice had not been made on our behalf. We ask now, Father, that you would bless this cup that we are about to partake with. Bless it to our, not only our physical bodies, body, but to our spiritual bodies, uh, our spiritual bodies as well. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. He is the God that 
through that song, Our God, He is Alive, is the Church of Christ National Anthem. <laughs> it's not wrong. It's, uh, it is one that, that it is, I don't know that I've ever been in a Church of Christ that I didn't think was quite capable of, king, of singing that song because it is so um, powerful and, um, and well known among the brethren. But it is interesting that, that we... Uh, we have that kind of a song. I mean, it used to be the songbook that, that I grew up in. I even knew the song number, and you could just say the song number, and everybody knew what you were talking about. So um, it's kind of funny. But today we're going to talk, uh, we're going to move from idolatry, which is what we talked about last week. And more importantly, when we talk about idolatry, we're talking, to, as we go through this study, we're talking about uh, elements of, of the Christian life that are a necessity, that are fundamental to being a Christian. So I wasn't talking yesterday about idolatry being fundamental, or last Sunday rather, about idolatry being fundamental to being Christian, obviously. Hopefully you understood that. What I was talking about was that was sort of the reverse of that. That idolatry has no place in a Christian's life, and that it is definitional to being a Christian, that we are not idolatrous people. Though we struggle with that because of the many things that this world throws at us that can easily distract us from God. But I want to flip that around and look at the other side of it today, which is what does a Christian do? It's a, a bad thing to define yourself solely by negatives. Well, I'm not like that, and I'm not like that, and I'm not like that. At some point, you've got to start saying, but I am like this. And when it comes to Christians, one of the things that we know, because we're here right now, is that Christians come together to worship. Over in Psalm 149, the psalmist says, Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, His praise in the assembly of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with salvation. Let the saints rejoice in this honor and sing for joy on their beds. There's a phrase in there that he uses, the assembly of the saints. And that's the concept we want to look at today, the assembly. This is an assembly of the saints. It's not the only one that's going on right now by any means. And there have been assemblies going on all day today, going back into what we would have considered before midnight last night as people met on the other side of the world. But the assembly takes place wherever Christians, the saints, gather together. And so we want to look at this concept of what it means to assemble, what it's for, and why we do it. Over in Deuteronomy chapter 6, God says, Watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship Him and swear by His name. You shall not follow other gods, other any of the gods of the peoples who surround you, for the Lord your God in, this, in the midst of you is a jealous God. Otherwise, the anger of the Lord your God will be kindled against you, and He will wipe you off the face of the earth. It kind of ended on a negative note. I might have just stopped at the first slide. But anyway, He says that you shall worship God, worship Him only, and swear only by His name. But then he also says that He's a jealous God. But notice what else he says. He says, the Lord your God in the midst of you. God identifies Himself to the people of Israel and says, you, I'm not some far away God who's telling you what to do from on high. I'm in the midst of you. I am your God. I am present here. And so as we look at this concept of the assembly, we want to kind of look at the question of what does our corporate worship look like? And when I use the word corporate, I'm not talking about corporation like, you know, Coca-Cola is a corporation or Nike or, you know, whatever it is. I'm talking about corporate in the sense of when we gather together, what does our worship look like? Under the Old Covenant, there were some very specific principles that had to be followed. Not principles, that's not even the right word. Rules that had to be followed. The Hebrew writer explains these over in Hebrews chapter 9. He says, The first covenant had regulations of divine worship in the earthly, the earthly sanctuary. So there was a tabernacle prepared. Later it would be a temple. The outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread, this is called the holy place. Behind the second veil there was a tabernacle, which is called the holy of holies, having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna, and Aaron's rod which budded, and the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. But in these things we cannot now speak in detail, and even without him going into detail, what you clearly get is this picture of, of symbolism. 
of ritualism, of necessary, I'm going to use a word, we're talking in, in class about words that kind of gone out of favor, I'm going to use a word that's kind of gone out of favor, accoutrements, which is basically the stuff that you use to make stuff happen. There's all these accoutrements, there's all of these different, different ceremonial objects that are associated with the temple worship, and, and until those things are ready, you can't start the worship. In fact, that the Hebrew writer goes on and says, now when these things have been prepared, or been so prepared, in other words, it's got to be exactly right. Nabadab and Abihu, some of the sons of Aaron, found out what happens if you don't do it exactly right, and the answer is you get burned to death. So, not a good thing. So they've got to be prepared just right, but then the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship, the sacrifices, the, the, the altar, the incense, they're doing these things. But into the second... Only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. So everything has to be exactly right. It all has to be ready before you can get started. But once it is, there is a formal process of worship that is undertaken at the temple, which is, or the tabernacle earlier, originally, which is where all of the people would assemble at certain times. Now, when the Old Covenant was first instituted, then the people were in a camp, they would all assemble at the tabernacle on a regular basis to worship. Once they got into the land, and some people were pretty far north and some were pretty far south, it became more of a matter of them coming together to worship on specific called out festival days that they were supposed to be there. But in any event, that worship went on even when they weren't all there. There were still sacrifices being done every day. There was a morning and evening sacrifice that was necessary no matter what else happened but also people who would come and bring sacrifices to offer for penance or for whatever else they might have done, those things went on all the time. And so the temple was the center of corporate worship for the Israelites. And they would do other things in smaller contexts in their communities, and later on as synagogues developed, those would be a place of worship. But when the whole assembly of Israel came together, it was at the temple. Well, sort of, mostly. It's kind of interesting because actually very early on in Israel's history, once they had uh, gotten to Mount Sinai and Moses had gone up on the mountain and he received the early, the original, the first commandments from God, he was still going up and down. He set up a tent of meeting, and later on the tabernacle would be referred to this way. It's a little bit confusing because of the, the, the use of the name. But he set up, a tent, set up a tent of meeting outside of the main camp of the Israelites where he would go to consult with God about matters relating to the Israelite camp. Now, he was still going up on Sinai to get the commandments from God that would become the law. But when it came to kind of a case-by-case -case question, somebody came and said, we've got a question of God, he would go out to the tent of meeting and they would go with him. And so in Exodus 33, it says, everyone who sought the Lord would go to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And it came about whenever Moses went out to the tent that all the people would arise and stand, each at the entrance to his tent, and gaze after Moses until he entered the tent. This is cool, but also kind of creepy. You know, I would think, like, <laughs> can you imagine a million people all coming out and standing at the front of their tent and just staring at you while you walk across in front of them and get into the tent? I mean, that's kind of creepy on, on some levels. But, but there's a fascination there, and we'll see why in a second here, because it says, whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud, it's referring to the pillar of cloud and fire that would go before them, Cloud in the daytime, fire at night. I'm assuming Moses only went into the tent, tent during the daytime because otherwise if the pillar of fire descended, that might be bad. But whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and worship each at the entrance of his tent. Why are they doing that? They're doing that because they realize the, the God already has already said, I'm in your midst, but now he's literally in their midst. Imagine that, actually being able to see the physical presence or the physical manifestation of the presence of the Lord and knowing that it's right there. Of course they're going to worship. Of course they're going to go stand outside their tent and watch Moses go because they're seeing a man going out to meet with God and God coming down and descending, not in a physical form, but with a physical representation. And then they worship because God is there with them. And we see this notion of the Israelites identifying, whether it was the tabernacle, the tent of meaning first, and then the tabernacle second, and finally the temple third, as the place where God lived. Not that they didn't realize that he could do stuff other places too, but it was the seat, the throne of God. And so when they went to those places, when they assembled there, they knew the Lord was in their midst, and that was a driver for their worship. Now, there's an interesting 
situation that develops over time when the Israelites go into captivity. Some of the people that are left behind intermarry with people of the land and they form the Samaritans and there becomes this clear divide between the Jews and the Samaritans and where they worship, although they both worship the Lord, they have a very different approach to it. The Jews have the temple, the Samaritans have the mountain, the mountains and where they live. And, and over in John chapter 4, when speaking to the woman at the well, the woman at the well recognizes that Jesus is a prophet, and she thinks, this is a great time to sort of get this question answered. Where are we supposed to worship? So she says, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, probably the last thing in the world that she expected, because it wasn't a, this one's right and that one's wrong. Instead he says, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Neither one is going to be the place where the, the, the saints assemble. He says, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. See, what he's saying is that there's a time that's coming, and it's on top of us right now to this woman, when it isn't going to be where you worship. It isn't going to be the ritual that you follow where you worship. It is going to be what's going on inside of you when you worship. And he can say that it, it now is, in the sense partly that he's bringing it with him, but also in the immediate sense that wherever you're worshiping, God wants you to worship in spirit and truth. And that was just as true for the Jews worshiping at the temple or in their synagogues, and for the Samaritans worshiping on their mountains and high places, as it would be later on when those things were gone, when those things weren't the place anymore. But God wants worshipers who will worship with their heart, worshipers who will worship with their spirit. And he's not so much going to be concerned about the where. Good thing, too, because it's only going to be another 40 years or so before the temple's going to be gone. And if that's the center of your worship, you're in real trouble at that point. So God, Jesus says, it's not the place, it's the heart. That's what's driving this. And because of that, what he's really giving, giving the, 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 the sense of is a warning or a, a heads up. There is a new way that is coming when it comes to worship, when it comes to the assembly. And the Hebrew writer explains this as well. He says, therefore, brethren, since we, and now he's speaking to Christians, to believers, since we have confidence into the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. He says, we draw near, we assemble, and we don't have to deal with all of that ritualism. There doesn't have to be all these things set up exactly right. And a physical holy of holies and an outer holy and an outer court and all these different processes. We don't have to do all that. We don't have to mess with that stuff. And on one level, I want to say, well, this is so much easier. And it is, but it's only because somebody actually did all of the arranging for us. Somebody did all the preparation. And Steve brought it out wonderfully in the Lord's Supper today by talking about exactly what Jesus did to prepare the way for us to be able to go into that sanctuary without fear. To assemble with and, and to draw near with the assurance of faith. We don't draw near without a sacrifice of blood. We don't draw near without the tabernacle having been properly prepared. It's just that priests don't take care of it anymore. One high priest offered himself as the sacrifice and took care of it for all time, for all of us. And now we draw near as those high priests drew near because we, each one of us, are sanctified by Jesus' blood. So never forget that when we assemble here, we assemble here without the need for ritualism because Jesus took care of the ritual. Jesus took care of the, 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 the rules and the things that had to be done. But the Hebrew writer goes on and he says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That phrase, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, is one of the favorite verses of the Church of Christ. You don't forsake the assembly. You know, it's wrong to forsake the assembly. You, you, you know, God doesn't want you to miss church because it's the assembly. And, and there's a degree of truth to that. But notice why he's saying that we should be assembling together. 
He says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Let us consider how we can encourage one another. Our assembly together is for worship, in part, but it serves greater purposes and have more purposes than that. And in particular, it serves the purposes of encouragement, of creating unity, of, 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 of stimulating us on to love and good deeds. And so it's not just about the ritual of worship. It is about doing things that will make us stronger as Christians. And we see this over in the book of Acts. When the first Christians begin to meet together, that is exactly what happens. It says, so then those who had received his word, this is the day of Pentecost, the 3,000 that were baptized. Those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The breaking of bread term there is one that is generally associated with the Lord's Supper, although it's not entirely clear that's what this is intended to mean. It's the same phrase that's used over, for example, in Acts chapter 20, where it seems pretty clear that they were talking about Paul and others coming together in part to break bread. And in fact, we see this just a couple of verses later, we see another reference to this that makes it even more clear the distinction, because it says, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart praising God and having favor with all the people. So you notice there, it kind of makes this distinction, breaking bread, taking their meals together, with the idea that what's happening is that they are celebrating the communion. But notice something, too, day by day. So and we're going to talk about the communion more at a later date, so I don't want to bang this drum too long. But they're doing this on a daily basis. They're commemorating the Lord's death on a daily basis, on, a, on a, more than just every Sunday. They're doing it on a regular basis. And they're doing it in conjunction with the larger nature of their assembling together. So they're breaking bread from house to house, which suggests the Lord's Supper, and taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. So more is going on here than they're just getting together and taking the Lord's Supper and singing some songs and maybe somebody's talking. They're eating together as well. And over in Corinthians, we see Paul talking to the Corinthians and telling them what's wrong with the way they're eating together. He doesn't tell them to stop doing it, but what he says is you're doing this wrong. And what we clearly develop is a picture that is also supported by history of how the early church's meetings together would go, and they were what we call a love feast. So you would gather together, not the entire assembly of 3,000 people, because that's not practical unless you've got somebody like Jesus to turn, you know, five loaves and two fishes into food for everybody, but they would meet together in smaller groups in houses, not even necessarily as individual churches, but in many cases in larger, in other settings, it would be individual churches. But they would meet together and they would bring food together and they would eat and they would celebrate. And as part of their eating, they would take time to do the Lord's Supper. And so unsurprisingly, at almost every time that you eat in the first century, two of the things you're going to have there is bread and wine. Because bread is the fundamental staple food commodity that you've got. And wine is the major drink that everybody has because almost everything else is unsafe. And so almost every time they ate, they'd have those present, and as a part of their meal, they would stop at some point and say, you know, they would go through a memory of the communion. They would go through the Lord's Supper together as a group. And so there is this idea that the worship of the early church, for the most part, was tied into what we would think of as a potluck, <laughs> almost. <laughs> and, and so there's kind of this interesting merging of these two concepts together. And then we see over in Corinthians some descriptions of some of the things that actually went on in the assembly, not always for the better. But Paul says, when you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Then another favorite verse from the Church of the Christ, but all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner, or decently and in order, as the, as the, uh, the King James says. <clears throat> Paul is dealing in this context with a church that is deeply troubled. <laughs> That's probably an understatement. They, they've got problems on a number of levels, but one of them is that their assemblies are chaotic. One of the reasons he criticizes their love feasts is not because they're having them, but because they're turning them into opportunities to get drunk ahead of the people who have to work and can't get there until later. So rather than feasting together in a way that's loving, they're coming together and the pe rich people that don't have to work that day are bringing their food with them and they're eating everything and getting drunk and by the time the poor people who have to work show up, all the food's gone and there's no Lord's Supper to be had. And so he says that's not acceptable and, and, he, and there's a suggestion perhaps that maybe they do need to go back eating in their homes when it comes to the rest of their food because they can't handle it correctly. 
but more broadly, the church is meeting together and they're eating together. And then the Corinthian church, he says that when you come, everybody has something you want to share. Now, notice, he says they have a teaching, they have a revelation, they have a tongue, they have an interpretation. These are spiritually inspired gifts. These aren't just people, hopefully at least, who are just getting up and talking randomly, you know, just wanting to have their two cents heard. The idea is that these are inspired to some extent. But Paul's going to say that even though they are inspired, there's still the possibility that, number one, it's not edifying, because if it's being done in a way that's, if you're speaking in a tongue and nobody else can understand it, that's not edifying. You need somebody to interpret. Um, if you are giving a revelation and somebody else interrupts you in the middle of it and it becomes a shouting match, that's not edifying anymore. And that's the kind of thing that will seem to be happening in Corinth. And so Paul finishes by saying that things have to be done properly and in an orderly manner. And man, have we grabbed that concept and run with it. You know? Now part of the problem is that this is the context of a house church. It would have been probably no more people that are here right now. But instead of being gathered like this where there's clearly somebody in front talking and everybody else is supposed to be listening, there is this idea that we're sitting around in a circle around a table and we're sharing more. And so it's designed more for people to, to share and not for one person to be in charge because there aren't paid preachers for the most part. There might be a few evangelists that are being supported to move to go from place to place, but there aren't paid preachers, and there's not a you know there's not somebody sending out an email with the order of worship who's supposed to do what. And so a lot of times it's kind of is kind of random. It's just let's get together and share the food and share the gospel, share the the, the blessings of being together. And so we just kind of see how it goes, you know. And maybe one Sunday it goes pretty quick because there's just a few people who want to sing something and. Nobody has anything to say specifically, and maybe the next Sunday it goes for three hours because there's a lot of things that need to be said. But there's a degree of chaos to it that's okay, except when it gets to the point where people aren't acting in love, and that's when Paul puts his foot down and says, you can't keep doing it this way. Well, as the churches started to get bigger, and it took a while because the churches were persecuted for the first 200 or 250 years of their existence, and you couldn't meet in large groups without drawing the attention of the government, so you didn't have churches of 100 people meeting in one place on Sunday morning because those hundred people were going to get arrested real quick. So churches continued to stay small until the 300s or so where Christianity became more mainstream and became more legal. And churches started to get bigger and you had churches that were 50 and 100 and 200 and 300 and then Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire. And suddenly everybody had to be on church on Sunday morning and you got really big churches at that point. And suddenly now you can't just have people randomly standing up and saying things in the middle of the worship because that's going to make for chaos and confusion. And so now we start enforcing this properly and orderly more strictly because we can't afford to have people just randomly doing things. And over time we develop this concept within the church, a concept that goes back to before the churches of Christ were officially formed in the 1800s, this concept of the acts of worship. Wait, that's, that's the word acts. These acts of worship, the five acts of worship. There are five acts of worship that we've identified. We identify singing as an act of worship. There's a script, we have scriptures to back it up. We're the church of Christ. So we have scriptures to back it up. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 talks about singing as an act of worship. Acts 12, 5 talks about prayer. 1 Corinthians 4, 17 talks about teaching and preaching. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 2 talks about giving, and Acts chapter 20, verse 7 talks about communion in a group setting, in a corporate worship setting. And so we define these acts of worship, these things that we're supposed to do when we come together, and we try very hard to make sure we get a little of each. Even if some of these things only have one or two actual examples in the scripture, we elevate them to the status of a required mandated thing we have to do when we come together or else we've missed out on one of the acts of worship and we're not talking about the acts I showed you at the beginning there. And so we define ourselves around our corporate worship, our Sunday morning or maybe if we're really, you know, really into it Sunday evening and even maybe midweek if we're really into it. Are, are getting together and that's when we worship and that's how we worship and we do it in a very regimented way because we don't want disorder to spring up in the middle of the worship service. And the danger becomes that if we're so afraid of disorder that we won't allow anything that's unexpected or different to happen that we begin to miss the big picture. And the big picture is that when we come together it's not about us. I mean it is. 
But it's not about me when I come together. When I come together, it's about you. And when you, it's about them. And more importantly than all of that, it's about Christ. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Jesus is here now with us. And not only that, but it's not just a Sunday morning or Sunday night thing. It's not just a midweek thing where two or three Christians are gathered together. The Lord, He says, I'm here with you. It's not just about Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday. It's not just about being in this place right here. It's wherever Christians are together, Jesus is there with them. Which kind of makes sense because the Holy Spirit lives in all of us. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. The danger of defining ourselves through the lens of decently and in order is that we start to think that this place is special. And it's only special because of who's here. And we start to think that this place is holy, and it's only holy because of who's here. Because Jesus is here, but even beyond that, because we are here. That sounds for sort of egotistical. I apologize. I don't mean it specifically because I'm here. I mean that because we come here and we bring with us the Holy Spirit, the temple of God, wherever we go is a holy place. Now, don't get a big head about that. It's not because of how great you are or how great I am. It's because the Holy Spirit is in us. But we are walking, talking, breathing temples of God. So wherever we go is holy because God is with us. God is in us. And whenever we come together, Jesus is here in a way even tra that even transcends that. He, the Lord, is in our midst. What did the Israelites do when the Lord was in their midst? They came out and worshipped because God is there. We don't worship to get God to come into our midst. We worship because God is in our midst. We worship because God is here. And when you recognize that, it becomes very hard to support some sort of sterile, um, disengaged, ritualistic form of worship because the Lord is here with us. And the Israelites had a ritualized form of worship, but Jesus has taken that away. So we should not be bound by ritual. We should not be bound by location when we think about where God is and where holiness is and where worship is because it's built into us now. And we certainly shouldn't limit it to Sunday morning and maybe Sunday night and maybe midweek. That is not the end and beginning of when worship takes place. There's something better, Jesus says. There's something that's coming and now is. There is the now and the not yet of what it means to assemble as Christians. Over in 1 Corinthians, Paul gives an idea of this. He says, love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with the childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. The Holy Spirit lives in us, in each one of us. That doesn't mean we understand God completely. The Holy Spirit lives in us and Jesus is here with us. That doesn't mean that I know everything I want to know about who Jesus is and that I fully understand who He is and what He taught and the salvation that He brings. The Holy Spirit and Jesus are with us and yet we still live and we are bound by the physicality of our bodies. And in that way we are limited and we will never fully understand what God intends for us to understand while we live in this life. There is a limitation there. And yet the Hebrew writer tells us that even in this limitation, we have come into something bigger than what we understand. We have come into something bigger than what we ever would have to live for if we were not part of the body of Christ. 
We have come into an assembly that is far beyond that of anything that any nation has ever gathered together. In Hebrews 12, the writer says, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness, and gloom, and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and the sound of words which sound was such that those who beg or heard them begged that no further word be spoken to them. He's talking about Sinai, and when the Israelites gathered around there in their assembly of a million plus strong, and listened to the words of God, or listened to the sound of God, as he descended on Sinai, and Moses went up to speak with him. He says, you haven't come to that kind of a situation, to that kind of assembly, which would be terrifying. And disturbing, and it was for the Israelites, they were terrified. He says, you, you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. This does not call for sterility, for disengagement, for, for, for being reserved. This calls for joy and for celebration. We have come to the general assembly of the saints. And it's not just a future thing. There's a future thing that's going to come when we're going to see this for what it really is, for the perfection that it is. But in the moment now, we have come to the assembly of the saints. We have come to Mount Zion. We have come to the city of the living God. We are there now as we assemble as Christians. We live in that place now as we live as Christians. There should be joy, excitement, enthusiasm. There should be the willingness to take some risks. Whether we're assembled as a group or whether we're doing it individually, there should be those things because we are in the presence of of the living God. We are the assembly of the saints and we always will be and it's going to get better not worse when we are ascended into heaven with God and we see what that assembly really looks like. We are in the general assembly. And our response to that, the response that's called for, Paul makes very clear in Romans, he says, therefore I urge you brothers, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Worship is not limited to the assembly here on Sunday mornings. It's not limited to doing it inside of this building. Worship is something we do every day because our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we give up our bodies, our sinful nature, the things that we might otherwise want to do, and we honor God who is in our midst even when we're not all here together on Sunday morning, and we live in a way that gives Him honor, and when we do that, we worship. When we do that, we transcend the, the idolatry and the failure of human nature, and we become something better. We become the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we take part in the assembly of the saints that is now and will be in eternity. Let's stand and say and up and up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross, lift by his royal banner, it must not suffer loss, from victory unto victory, his army shall be. Oh, 
Jesus, the strife will not be.